you so much, Debbie, and thanks to the uh, Peninsula Interfaith uh, uh, Climate Action for uh, putting on this great event. And um, thanks also to my organization, Post Carbon Institute, which is headquartered up in Corvallis, Oregon, for, um, for supporting uh, my work. I am basically a writer. I'm not a uh, physicist or an engineer, but I find myself writing uh, over the last 20 years or so almost entirely about energy issues. And the reason for that is, um, as, a, as a young writer, I was seeking to understand why the world is the way it is. And uh, with, I, I've always had sort of an environmental interest, so I was wondering, you know, how is it that this one species would be acting in such a self-destructive way, you know, undercutting its own long-term vi biological viability uh, through resource depletion and pollution and, and so on. And so I, uh, I looked at economic history and uh, even mythology and the history of religions, all, all sorts of different places. But it wasn't really until I started studying energy that I came up with answers that really seemed satisfying. Energy, after all, is the basis of everything. We literally cannot do anything without energy. And we human beings used energy in renewable forms for most of our time on Earth, for tens of thousands of years. Uh, our main fuel was firewood. And we exerted energy to change the environment around us, mostly through muscle power. Now this changed, of course, over the course of the last couple of hundred years as we gained access to fossil fuels. And that changed everything. With fossil fuels, it became possible to do things that were unimaginable previously because they were energy dense, storable, and portable. Um, maybe you've had the experience of running out of gas in your car and having to push your car over to the side of the road. That's a lot of work. Well, imagine pushing your car, say, 30 miles. That would really be a lot of work, right? It would be weeks of work, but we get that done for us with a single gallon of gasoline for which we're paying maybe $3.50 and complaining. That is incredibly cheap energy, and it's the basis of the economic growth that we've seen over the past century, that we've gotten used to, and that now economists assume is the birthright of all modern industrial people. We must have more economic growth above all things. If you think of it in energy terms, we discovered a pot of buried treasure and we've been spending it as fast as we possibly can. Now, at, at first, one of the problems with fossil fuels was that they could, they could make the economy actually go faster than we were prepared for it to do. Uh, we could make stuff faster than people were accustomed to buying and using it with powered assembly lines. And this was one of, actually one of the causes of the Great Depression, the problem of overproduction. So we had to find ways to solve the problem of overproduction. And we developed two primary strategies. One was advertising talking people into wanting more stuff than they realized they wanted. And the other was consumer credit, making it easier for people to go into debt to buy stuff now and hopefully maybe pay for it later. And with these two innovations, uh, the advertising industry, which also included uh, planned obsolescence, you know, making stuff so that it would naturally wear out uh, or become unattractive before it had come to the end of its, its useful lifetime. With these strategies, we created what's called the consumer culture. We be, instead of citizens, we became consumers. That's our main role in the economy. 
Now, all of this is well and good, except for the fact that fossil fuels have a couple of problems. One of which is that they are, by definition, non-renewable resources. That means we started running out with the very first coal, oil, and natural gas that we dug out of the ground. It's not as though we're about to run out of any of these fossil fuels, but what we've done, of course, is to extract them using the low-hanging fruit principle. So we've gotten the easiest, cheapest, highest quality coal, oil, and natural gas first, and we've left the nasty, dirty, expensive, hard-to-get stuff for later. And in many ways, it's, it's now getting to be later. The other problem, of course, is that burning fossil fuels releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, which gets absorbed by the oceans, and it's a giant chemistry experiment. We are changing the chemistry of the, of the atmosphere and oceans with evidently uh, dire effects. So just a little bit on the subject of depletion, because this is something that not many people talk about, and we at Post Carbon Institute have actually done quite a lot of uh, original research on, on the subject. Um, <clears throat> many of you may remember that about 10 years ago, uh, some folks were talking about peak oil, the possibility or likelihood that world oil production would peak soon and go into decline, and we weren't ready for that. Um, well, that discussion pretty much went away as a result of the increasing production of what's called light tight oil here in the United States produced by hydrofracturing. Light tight oil is oil that's trapped in low porosity rocks. Geologists call them source rocks. It's basically all that's left after we've produced all of the easy to get conventional oil. Um, <clears throat> Now, as, as you can see, if you, if you can see it, uh, this is, a, this is a, a chart showing basically who's making money and who's losing money on tight oil. And most of the companies that are producing tight oil are losing money. Why? Because it's such a crappy resource. Um, the, the oil is there, but because the rocks are, have such low permeability, it requires hydrofracturing and horizontal drilling to get the oil out. A typical well uh, declines in production rate by about 70 to 90 percent in the first three years, which means that more and more wells have to be drilled in order to keep production rates up. So the appearance is that we are swimming in oil. U.S. oil production has just hit an all-time record, which is something that I, I have to say for myself, I, I, 10 years ago, I would never have imagined happening. Right? So it's, it's quite a feat. But the question is, is this a long-term resource? Are we going to be seeing similar rates of production of tight oil in the US? And this, this also goes for shale gas as well. Or is this a short-term boom that could be over in just a matter of years? Our research suggests that it's, it's the latter. And we, we, as I said, we have done original research on this subject. We subscribe to a proprietary industry. Uh, production databases, uh, and, and so we're able to look at per well uh, data and crunch the numbers. Uh, this is a, a similar chart for shale gas, and as you can see, again, those red bars, that's, those are companies that are losing money. Exxon and the big companies, for the most part, are not in tight oil. Uh, most of the companies that are producing tight oil are, are small to medium-sized companies, and that's why you're not recognizing the names. And Exxon, if, if you look at the balance sheets for Exxon, Shell, and the other uh, big majors, their uh, profit uh, margins have declined pretty dramatically in the last few years. Uh, it, rates of discovery have declined to the lowest level in 70 years. The, the cheap, easy stuff, the regular conventional oil that made the 20th century what it was is going away. 
and it's increasingly being replaced by unconventional oil, light tight oil, Canadian tar sands, ultra deep water oil that have a much lower energy profit ratio as well as a much lower financial profit ratio. Of course, the financial profit depends on oil prices, but the energy profitability uh, depends on other factors that are, that are more difficult to, to deal with. That's how much energy has to be invested in finding, developing, drilling, and producing oil versus how much energy you get out of the oil that you produce. And that ratio back in the 20th century was often 50 to 1 or higher. And that's, that's one of the factors that created the economic miracle of the 20th century. That energy itself was so cheap to get in energy terms, not just in dollar terms, but in energy terms. And that's no longer the case. So uh, this is... This is the situation with uh, global per capita primary energy uh, production, consumption. Um, and as you can see, it's grown pretty dra dramatically, over 800%. This is, this is global again, since 1850. Uh, and you know, 88% of that is uh, fossil fuels. So we are overwhelmingly dependent on fossil fuels. But this is a inherently unsustainable situation. And when I say unsustainable, I don't, I don't mean it's insufficiently eco-groovy. <laughs> I mean it can't continue. Now, how long it conti can, can continue, I guess we'll find out. But it's not something that, that, you know, a century or two from now, we won't be living this way. Now, that means we're going to have to change. Clearly, we are going to have to change to different energy sources. So what are those likely to be? Um, we did a study at Post Carbon Institute, which is the basis for this talk tonight, uh, which was published as a book called Our Renewable Future. We've got a couple of copies over there, and it's also available as a free download from uh, our website. If you want to read it, just go to ourrenewablefuture.org. The entire text is there. Uh, so we uh, focused on solar and wind. Um, and the reason for that is, uh, in our estimation, uh, and not just ours, but many uh, energy experts around the world now are seeing, uh, nuclear is having very low probability of, uh, of viability as a as an ultimate uh, energy resource um, for a number of reasons, and including cost, um, but also uh, public perception of risk. Um, we could go on. So solar and wind being the best candidates in most energy uh, experts' view at this point, uh, what will be involved in making a switch to solar and wind power? And that's what I'm going to, that's the subject I'm going to be addressing for the rest of this, this talk. Um, there, there's an enormous amount of politics around the discussion of solar and wind. And I'm going to try as best I can to stay away from political statements in this regard. Um, my co-author, on, on this project was David Fridley, who's a staff scientist in the Energy Analysis Program at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory. I learned a tremendous amount from working with David, and one of the things I appreciated about working with him was that he, he is uh, very focused on, um, on physical reality and numbers and measurement. Um, <clears throat> so one of the one of the challenges with making this transition, of course, is that solar and wind, this is also true of nuclear and hydropower, produce electricity. But currently, we only use about 20% of our final energy in the form of electricity. Right? So the other 80% we're using mostly in the form of liquid and gaseous fuels for transportation, agriculture, industrial processes, building heat, and, and so on. 
So if we're going to transition to solar and wind, that means we have to electrify a lot of energy usage. The energy transition is going to be just as much or perhaps way more about transitioning how we use energy as opposed to just building a lot of wind turbines and solar panels. It's not going to be that easy. Um, <clears throat> Often you will read or hear that a certain locale, an island or a city or maybe even a country in Europe, on a particular day got 80% or maybe even 100% of its energy from solar and wind. I, I hope I'm educating you here on, on a little piece of energy literacy. What they really mean is that locale got 80 or 100 percent of its electricity from renewable sources. So it got 80 or 100 percent of that 20 percent of its energy from renewables. So we actually have quite a long ways to go in this, in this process. One of the challenges, of course, is that solar and wind are variable sources. Some people use the word intermittent sources of energy in that the sun doesn't always shine, wind doesn't always blow. And so we have to use some combination of three different strategies for accommodating this variability. One of these strategies, of course, is storage, storing energy in some fashion, whether it's through batteries or compressed air or pumping water uphill into a reservoir when we have lots of, of electricity so that we can let it flow back down out of the reservoir through turbines and recover some of that energy. Storage al always implies energy losses. Um, <clears throat> so storage is one strategy. The second strategy is source redundancy. So you build lots more generation capacity than you're likely to need at any one moment. Because, well, if the sun isn't shining here, maybe it'll be shining over there, or maybe the wind will ble be blowing over there. If you know, so if you build lots of redundant generation capacity, then hopefully things will level out and you'll, you'll still be able to get as much energy as you need at any given time. The third strategy is demand management, finding ways to use energy when it's available and not use it when it isn't available. Of course, that requires behavior change not necessarily conscious behavior. It could be system behavior. We, it could imply, for example, having um, uh, industrial systems or home systems, uh, electrical systems uh, that are wired in to recognize when prices are low, when electricity is abundant and prices are low and then things switch on. You put your clothes in the washing machine and press a button and maybe the machine doesn't go on right away because electricity is expensive right now. But five hours later the machine goes on and does your laundry. <clears throat> this is one uh, study's attempt to visualize the energy transition. The, uh, the sort of purple, uh, uh, purple blue uh, energy sources are fossil fuels and the sort of yellow, green, tan uh, areas are um, various renewables. And as you can see, the, uh, the, the switch is uh, pretty dramatic. In, in character and it has to start soon and it has to be rapid for two purposes. One, in order, of course, to avoid catastrophic climate change. If we're going to get to 2050 with most of our energy coming from renewable sources, that means we have to act very, very quickly. Typically, 
energy transitions go very slowly. And typically in the past, they've been additive. Remember this, uh, this picture here, you know, we're still using firewood as an energy source. It's just we've added a bunch of other things to it. We've added coal, and we're still using coal, even though we started using it back in the 19th century. We added oil, and we're still using oil. We've added natural gas. What we're talking about now is an energy transition that isn't just additive. We're replacing previous energy sources with novel ones. That's something that's really never been done before. Now, the pace of renewables uh, investment was growing pretty rapidly for a number of years. In the last few years, it's more or less leveled off. And that's a cause for some concern because um, according to the folks who, who uh, did this study, a uh, team of scientists led by my Italian friend, Ugo Bardi, uh, this team of scientist, uh, scientists arrived at the conclusion that we need to be moving at about 10 times our current rate in replacing fossil fuels with renewables if we're going to avert catastrophic climate change and also avert the economic impact of fossil fuel depletion. So we're, we're not, right now we're not getting there. Yes, it's true we are installing more and more solar and wind and it's true also that the prices of solar and wind are declining. But even if the price of solar and wind drops to the point where in every instance it's lower than that of a new coal power plant or a new natural gas power plant, the market will not drive the transition fast enough. That's the conclusion, yes. Is this investment in uh, technology or investment in windmills and solar? Uh, this, is, this is actual investment in new uh, solar and, and wind generation capacity. One other clarification. Does yeah. this include the subsidies that we all pay? Uh, well, th yes. I mean, if, if the subsidies end up uh, actually, you know, purchasing new generation capacity, then that's reflected. No yeah. cost. So we were able to, to identify kind of three levels uh, of action that, that need to happen in order for us to have a successful energy transition. And so, some of the stuff is, is relatively easy. And, and that's, that's kind of where you know, we should uh, start right away. Although we can't just do these things in in order, you know, finish with the easy stuff before we start the harder stuff. We have to start the, the hard stuff at the same time we start the easy stuff. It's just important to know, you know, what we can, what we can expect to do relatively soon. So getting rid of coal power, we put in the easy category because there are replacements available now and coal is, is the dirtiest source of electrical power. And just about everybody knows that and realizes it. Uh, So-called clean coal has no future. Um, it's, it's purely a marketing ploy by the coal industry and the coal power industry. Uh, it, it adds significantly to the cost of uh, electricity from coal to capture all of the CO2 from our coal plants in this country would require us to build infrastructure roughly on the scale of the oil and gas industry because we're talking about so much CO2 and so having to capture it and concentrate it, send it through pipelines with um, uh, the, the various attendant infrastructure would be you know, just ri ridiculously pro prohibitive. Uh, another thing we can do right now is start to electrify some things like uh, building heat. Uh, there are very good technologies right now, such as um, air source heat pumps. Anybody here have an air source heat pump? Yeah, good for you. 
Um, <clears throat> not many people even know about them at this point, but it's an excellent alternative to natural gas space heating. Uh, it's much more energy efficient than the old uh, resistance wall wallboard heaters. Uh, and so this is something that we really should be getting going on right now. Of course, electric cars. Unfortunately, cars are not a, a particularly energy efficient way of moving people around. So rather than thinking of the electric car as sort of the be all and end all, I prefer to think of it as, as kind of a, um, you know, a, a desperate act of triage. You know, <laughs> over the long term, we should be aiming for public transportation and by rail wherever possible because the most efficient way of moving people and stuff by, you know, ton per mile is, is by rail. And then, of course, getting people out of vehicles and walking and bicycling is, is even better where, wherever that's feasible. So that, that means redesigning our community. This is not an easy thing. And, it's, and quite frankly, I think there's a lot of this that's not going to get done. And as a result, we just won't have a lot of mobility and convenience that we've come to expect. These are the easy things. These are the easy things, yeah. We're still in the easy category. We had some of the world's best public transportation in this country in the 1940s. We systematically dismantled it. We can systematically choose differently for the future. Um, our food system, heavily dependent on fossil fuels, a typical, uh, calorie of food energy represents roughly 10 calories of fossil fuel input, not just in you know tractors and growing the food, but in transporting it and especially in processing and packaging it. So rethinking the food system, localizing our food system, uh, prioritizing uh, local production for local consumption, reduce chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, reduce <coughs> processing, packaging. These are things obviously we can do right now just by making different choices. Now, to, to fully transition the food system, that's, that's getting to you know, harder stuff. Um, obviously, building um, a, a lot of solar panels and wind turbines is going to be part of the process. And you know, beyond a certain point, it's, uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it becomes more and more difficult to find siting locations. Uh, and the, 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 it, right now, we're, you know, we're still picking the very low hanging fruit in terms of siting solar and wind in this, in this country. Um, so when, when we get to the point of actually producing you know, a significant percentage of total energy from these sources, uh, we're talking about land use issues and well, uh, trade-offs that will be contentious in many cases. We're also talking about storage, uh, pretty large amount of storage, and, and who's going to pay for that? Will it be the grid operators? Will it be, how will those costs be pass, passed along? These are issues that are, being, that are being thought through, but they're certainly not uh, fully taken care of at this point. Uh, building some of that public transportation infrastructure and rail infrastructure, that's in, that's in the harder stuff. Remember, the, the, the electric cars were in the easy stuff. But then other forms of transportation like um, shipping, uh, in, international uh, freight and, and, and travel, um, <clears throat> we may have to reinvent sales, and there are companies that are, that are working on this. So far, they're, they're envisioning sales not as providing 100% uh, of motive power for, uh, for shipping, but you know, in, in the best instance, maybe 80%. So it would, that would reduce the use of uh, oil 
for shipping uh, pretty dramatically. Uh, then, you know, how, how do we build our structures? Um, in Germany, there's what's called the passive house movement, where structures are designed, homes and, and buildings, to use 10, 20%, sometimes 5% the energy that we're accustomed to using in this country to operate a building. So we're talking about uh, super insulation, daylighting, using, using daylight instead of electric lights whenever uh, possible, zero energy homes and buildings. This has all been pioneered. We know how to do it. In fact, the, the passive house movement in Germany drew upon initial research done in this country back in the 1970s. But then it was the Germans who actually ran with that information and we in this country, you know, whereas they have 20,000 of these structures in a much smaller country, we have, you know, maybe a thousand. So uh, we're talking there about um, building codes so that whenever a new structure is built, it has to meet much higher energy standards. Oops. Okay, now we're getting to the, the really hard stuff. <laughs> um, <clears throat> a lot of our larger buildings, well, pretty much all of them, are built using uh, concrete and steel. And it turns out that concrete and steel are really hard to make with electricity. Um, there are electric arc furnaces, yes, but those are mostly used with recycling steel. Um, if you're talking about you know, new steel from pig iron, that's, uh, then, then we're talking about blast furnaces burning coke. Um, this, the, uh, the concrete, the, the, the crucial ingredient, of course, is cement. And cement is produced in huge kilns operating at 1,500 degrees centigrade at 24 hours a day. Now, it's theoretically conceivable that you could run a cement kiln on some kind of fuel produced with renewable energy, or that you could even use you know, uh, mirrors and solar collectors to produce extremely high temperatures of 1,500 degrees Celsius uh, to make cement. But nobody's doing it right now because it would almost certainly be more expensive and nobody has the process thought through. So there's probably 10 years of research and development before anyone is going to be making uh, cement at any scale. This is, this is some of the hard stuff. So if we are serious about making the energy transition, we have to start exploring now how to use less concrete and steel in making new buildings, use more local natural materials and recycled materials, and build more on a human scale. It's because we had access to cheap concrete and steel that we started building huge structures, you know, because we could do so very cheaply. We could enclose a lot of space very cheaply. Um, as that equation changes, I think we're going to build sm much smaller structures, generally speaking, rather than, you know, a new uh, house being, you know, 2,400, 4,800 square feet, 7,000 square feet, um, the typical McMansion, I think we'll probably return to, you know, more 800 to 1,000 square foot home as, as a typical new home um, and, and other buildings similarly. And of course, all designed for low energy operation. Resource extraction. <clears throat> has become uh, much cheaper over the last few decades. And we, we extract resources, both renewable and non-renewable resources, at um, uh, much higher rates than we did in previous times because we have access to you know, giant machines running on mostly on diesel. 
Now, it's possible to imagine these, these machines uh, running. If you, if you imagine a couple of big wind turbines up on the horizon there with power cables running down to the machines, that could work. But it's going to be more expensive, it's going to be more difficult, and it's very unlikely that we'll be doing this at the scale that we currently are. Um, when we, you know, we were doing a, a, a theoretical, you know, mental experiment of replacing all of our fossil fuels. And when we got to some things, you know, we just hit a brick, brick wall. And we, and we were working with um, consultants in 25 different areas. Um, with, with construction, heating, various areas of transportation, industrial processes, and so on. And um, our, our public health and uh, medical technology uh, consultant, when we asked him, you know, how could we do all these things without fossil fuels, just looked perplexed. <laughs> he could not imagine uh, modern medicine and public health without plastics, without pharmaceuticals made with and from fossil fuels and so on. So uh, we reluctantly had to um, assume that as time goes on, we will continue to use fossil fuels, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, in situations where we just don't have alternatives available, and then over time we'll have to try to imagine how to how to how to do these things. Yes. Can plastics be made out of vegetable oil? Plastics can be made out of uh, um, various kinds of uh, bi biological materials, and our that is happening on, on an ever larger scale. The problem is with plastics that have uh, very high performance requirements. Uh, you know, disposable plastic forks, easy. Medical equipment, not so easy. Especially with the pharmaceuticals themselves, there were, we, we spent quite a number of hours going back and forth with our consultant on this, trying to convince him that there were, you know, more and more ways out, and he, he kept pushing back. So, uh, in general, <clears throat> uh, our, find, our, our finding was that, you know, we're going to have to do a lot of things on a smaller scale with more human labor, using more recycled and natural materials, reuse and repair things. And none of this fits very well with the ethos, the economic model that we've developed over the last few decades that we call consumerism. Um, when we got to the, the con consumer electronics industry, we ran into another brick wall. We, we, we set ourselves the thought of experiment. Um, could you make a smartphone without fossil fuels? Uh, and we put that to a, another consultant. And he, he, he actually has been running this thought experiment himself for a few years. And uh, his, his, uh, his conclusion was the, probably the best thing at least for the time being, is um, imagine a future where you get your smartphone when you're 18, <clears throat> and uh, <laughs> as various parts wear out and break, you get them replaced or repaired, and you don't expect to get a new one every 18 months. Aviation is another uh, really difficult area. Um, it's, it's possible to imagine uh, big airliners running on sophisticated biofuels, and there is research going on um, in the U.S. military and some of the commercial airline companies uh, to uh, see if how feasible this is. Uh, I, I, it's almost surely physically feasible. Whether it's economically feasible is another question, because biofuels. Um, typically compete with food crops and habitat 
for other species. Uh, and second and third generation biofuels like uh, biodiesel made from algae have not tended to work out as well as was initially hoped. And a, a big problem with biofuels, and particularly second generation biofuels, is the energy return on energy invested, the amount of energy that has to be uh, uh, invested in making the fuel is in many cases nearly the same as the amount of energy that's derived from the fuel at the end of the process. So there are other possibilities like redesigning airplanes to run on hydrogen, but that would require you know, basically starting with a blank sheet of paper um, <clears throat> Uh, or making fuels using renewable electricity, maybe uh, methanol or something like that. It's, you know, there, there are theoretically possible ways of solving all of these problems. It's just that some of them are going to take a lot of research and development, and in the end, they'll probably be a lot more expensive than the way we're doing them now. And aviation is in that in that category. Um, <clears throat> there, there are some uh, good news stories in all of this. Uh, where uh, there's been quite a lot of research recently on the the potential for capturing and storing atmospheric carbon back in soils, and. Um, whether this quote ends up being accurate or not, this is from a couple of years ago, and some more recent uh, research would tend to question this, you know, two percent and a hundred percent. But nevertheless, um, <coughs> capturing and sequestering atmospheric carbon in the biosphere, in forests, and in in uh, renewed topsoil. Uh, it seems to be, you know, a uh, a win-win situation. Yes. Isn't the relative surface area? Isn't the ocean always going to be the main carbon capture? Uh, What's the question? It, it, given the surface area, isn't the ocean always going to be the main carbon capture? Yes, um, but it's bad news, right? Because we're we're creating uh, carbonic acid and acidifying the ocean. So, all, you know, this is. This is a huge undertaking. And by calling it a huge undertaking, I don't mean to be discouraging. And uh, I'm, what, I, what I'm just trying to do is help you see you know, the scale of what we're talking about. It's not just a matter of unplugging the coal power plant, plugging in a solar panel, and calling it done. This is going to be a project for decades. Uh, and it's going to require cooperative effort at every level of society if we're going to do it well. Uh, as I said earlier, I don't think we're necessarily going to do it well in every instance. You know, we, we are complicated animals and, and we. Uh, we don't like bad news, we, and we, and we want to keep doing what we're already doing as long as we can, even if it's you know, not, not the smartest way to go. Um, so most likely, we will end up having a lot less energy than we currently do or would like to have in the future. And in, in some ways, we, sh we should know that already. I mean, this is information from the uh, Global Footprint Network. They figure that we're already overusing the world's resources by you know, 40 percent or something like that. We do that by drawing down future productive carrying capacity of the planet. And if everyone lived the way we do in the US, we would, we would need something like four Earths to make it happen. So we already know that the scale of our consumption, particularly in the rich industrialized countries, is unsustainable. We need to scale back. Consumerism has no future, no matter how you look at it. So if you think of the energy transition in those terms, that you know, using less energy, reducing our demand, makes the problem easier to solve. Yeah. Oh. 
1.67 GHA. What is a GHA? Uh, Global productive activities. Yeah, right. So our, our conclusion was that our renewable future is going to feature less total energy and, and in places like North America, probably considerably less energy per capita. Um, our energy is going to be less controllable. We'll do more adapting to uh, our energy sources rather than just assuming that energy will be around for us anytime we want. It's probably going to be a less mobile society, which means a more, localized, more localized economies. Um, and there, uh, there could be many benefits of that. The arguments for economic relocalization are uh, multitudinous. But uh, whether, whether we like the idea or not, it seems almost inevitable that that's, that's where we're headed. Also, <clears throat> the subject of energy equity is one that's being raised uh, globally. And it really makes sense for us to help people in less industrialized countries leapfrog the, the fossil fuel um, mode of what we've called development and go straight for um, a true 21st century way of life based on uh, renewable energy, um, recycling, circular economy. There are opportunities on all of this, a more efficient economy, an acceptable quality of life, and maybe happier. This all feeds into the, the discourse around GDP and what, what do we measure? What, what makes for a, a successful uh, economy? Is it just you know, more stuff changing hands, uh, uh, extracting more raw materials, turning them into products, and then turning those products into waste, and doing that as quickly as we possibly can? Right now, that's basically our economic model. And if we, and if we do that, we call it success. But shouldn't the economy really be for making people happy and satisfied with their lives? And if we make that the goal, then it's easy to imagine us using a lot less stuff, uh, traveling a lot less, and being much happier. Um, those opportunities will, if we, in order to take advantage of those opportunities, it's going to require investment. It's probably going to require regulation of different kinds changes in behaviors and expectations, and really a, a different kind of economy from what we've, what we've come to expect. Uh, and a lot of adaptation to new circumstances. So once again, this is the, uh, this is the study, and uh, you can find it at that website. I encourage you to take a look at it, because we, um, not only did we put a lot of good faith effort into it, but since it came out a year or so ago, I've been looking for other researchers to basically take this work to the next level. And I keep seeing lots of folks who haven't even gotten to this level yet. So um, the, the more of us who can sort of be on, on this landing point, the easier I think it will be to then start building on that and get to the, the, the next uh, next level of shared understanding. So I hope this, is, this has been helpful for you. And uh, we have some time for more questions and discussion. Yes. Hi, um, I wondered, uh, since I, I teach about climate change, behavior change, mm -hmm. um, first question is um, about hydrogen, because I keep hearing about that a lot, and you didn't mention it, I just wonder if you think it's got a place in all this, that's one question. Yeah. And second question is, I know when you first started you said you don't want to 
dip into the political realm, and I totally appreciate that. But I also think that um, all these things you want us to do, or would like us to do, are going to take political will. Mm -hmm. And so we have to, at some point, think about politics, it seems to me. Right. So. Yeah, uh, well, first, hydrogen. Um, <clears throat> Hydrogen, of course, is a way of storing energy. Uh, we, we can uh, extract the hydrogen from water or other things, but water is pretty, pretty abundant and convenient. But it takes energy to do that, so, and it takes more energy to extract the hydrogen than the hydrogen will give us. So there's an energy cost in, in producing the hydrogen. And there's some co energy cost in storing hydrogen also. Um, so the question is, is it a more or less efficient way of storing energy than other options? And I think the answer to that is going to be, it depends. Different uh, situations will, uh, will call for different storage solutions. Uh, the, probably the, the there was actually a conference here at Stanford a couple of years ago that I attended on uh, energy storage. And, uh, and some, some of the scientists at Stanford had come up with metrics on you know, energy storage, on investment, and so on. And the, the storage uh, medium that scored highest was uh, pumped water. But pumped water is only practical in certain situations. You have to have the right geo uh, geography uh, and so on. Very few places do. And the amount of storage we're going to need is, is more than, than we can do with, with pumped hydro. So um, it's, it's very possible that hydrogen would be you know, useful in some situations. Will we have a hydrogen, hydrogen economy? I, I doubt it very much because it is, it is hard to store, and there are other storage options that will, that will be preferable in, some, in other situations. I wonder if you looked at, um, I mentioned I'm skeptical about train tracks being run through all the cities, but it strikes me that self-driving cars would be that fun ways of cars and roads would be light trains to get the air efficiency and so forth. You're going to have efficiency through that. Do you look at anything like that? Self-driving cars? In other words, you have self-driving vehicles. So I'm imagining you could have convoys of cars Pulled by a self-driving vehicle, in other words, training trains on freeways, it would be you know, convoys of cars pulled together. Yeah. Well, there, there, um, there, there are lots of possibilities for um, land, uh, uh, personal land transport. There's one that is called uh, PRT, personal rapid transit, which is involves pods running on uh, up. Uh, it's kind of pylons up above roads. And th those could be extremely energy efficient, but so far nobody's invest investing in them. So there are lots of possibilities. I think, you know, it's going to be a lot of trial and error. Self-driving vehicles in general, I think we're, the, the jury is very much still out on those. The amount of uh, computer power that's required in, in the vehicle to make those work is actually quite astounding. And you know, maybe that will work out on, on a large scale, or maybe not. Um, so to follow up on some of those uh, technologies, are there technologies that are essentially distractions from where we need to go? Because at mm -hmm. first, you know, everybody says, don't pick winners and losers. At this point, we don't have time to run down the road right. 20 years to see if hydrogen works or 30 years right. because it's a distraction. I see the self-driving car potentially as another distraction because we can't move people one at a time anymore with that much steel and batteries and everything. Right. So do you have some top listings of distraction technologies that we should have? <laughs> California Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I think hydrogen cars, you know, have been proposed for a long time, and and if they were going to take off, I think they would have done so by now. So putting a lot more effort and attention into, you know, a fuel cell, via private vehicles, I think is is probably a waste of money at this point. 
and there are others like carbon capture and, and storage, I think, on imagining that that on a large scale is going to, to uh, solve our climate problem, I think is wishful thinking. One more here on politics. Okay. Oh, yes. Sorry, I didn't, I didn't comment on the politics. Yeah, well, right. You don't, you don't get to policy without politics. And uh, all of this is going to require policy at some point. So how do we get to political consensus? And in this country right now, that is such a difficult thing to imagine. Um, frankly, I think we, you know, we, we need to start rebuilding politics from the ground up, starting at the local level. Because it's a local level where you can look each other in the eye and hopefully get beyond the stereotypes and, and begin to you know, uh, build, uh, build a consensus that can, that can carry us through. Without that, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not very optimistic that we'll be able to do very much anytime soon, policy-wise, at least on the national level. You would we be pushing for in Palo Alto to do more than what we're doing? We're, we've been like paying a 10% tax to get on our energy use to get up to 100% renewable energies, but the next step is what we need to take now. So, do you have any ideas? Yeah, well, it, it, if in fact you're getting all of your electricity from renewable sources now, then the next step, of course, is electrifying. Your, uh, your other energy uses, transportation, uh, food system, uh, heating, cooling, uh, heating and cooling of buildings, and, and so on. And looking at building uh, standards, uh, building regulations to, to uh, ensure that all, all new future buildings need much higher energy uh, efficiency standards pull out your crystal ball, how much of this are people going to have to take care of on their own, you know, neighborhood by neighborhood, family by family, versus somehow nationally, internationally, get it together? Um, if it's family by family, I think um, you know, our, our future looks pretty bleak, frankly. Um, we have to uh, at least work together as communities. And again, that, that's, that's a lot of face-to-face -face stuff and getting beyond stereotypes and, and assumptions. Um, so at, at Post Carbon Institute, most of our work these days is uh, around building community resilience. And you'll see one of, one, of our, one of our most recent books is the Community Resilience Reader uh, with multiple authors. And our, our main public website is called resilience.org. And it's updated on a daily basis with news from around the world on uh, community resilience building in, in the food shed and uh, building and construction and you know collective decision making all all the areas that need attention as we make our communities more sustainable and resilient for uh, for where we're going, what's coming. I'm here. Yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. It's, it's excellent. Um, I, my family and I have lived in one of those passive net zero homes for the last seven years, and it, I would actually put it as a easy when it's a new construction, and it didn't cost that much more energy in life. We love it. It's yeah. just a living space, and you wouldn't know it was a passive home. But the hard part for us is, uh, for example, if I could take my electric car after the battery being would run down to 15 kilowatt hours and I put that on the side of my house, I wouldn't need the grid from roughly March until October. But come October, November, December, I need more energy from the grid. And, I, and storage on a second by second basis, hour by hour basis, even 24 hours is easy. But seasonal storage, right. which is what we're going to need to go to if we electrify everything, because it doesn't, the sun does not shine that much in the wintertime. Right. And we still don't have enough wind. That's an awful lot of wind, and that means an awful lot of new power lines. It's really hard, and, and, and um, I, after you know, 
30 years in no nukes, I'm leaning towards you know baseline nuclear at this point in time. Because we've got to do something. We have to do it fast. Um, so I, I, if you have a, a silver bullet called seasonal storage, I'd really like to hear that. <laughs> yeah, well, I, uh, thank you for bringing that up. That's that's one of the one of the big difficulties, and um, you know, it, it's it's not as not as difficult here as it is in in some parts of the world. But yeah, during the winter we get a lot of cloudy days, and if you have you know uh, two weeks of clouds, that's going to deplete all, you know almost anybody's batteries. So you have to have some other kind of storage or intermittent or, or excuse me redundant generation capacity in the form of uh, you know something else wind or nuclear or tidal or geothermal. The thing is, if if we reduce our energy usage pretty dramatically, then some of these other sources can become much more important. <laughs> Uh, energy resources like geothermal, for example, you know, it, it's certainly geothermal cannot be scaled up to provide uh, electricity uh, on the on the scale that we're currently using in this country. But if we reduce our scale of usage pretty significantly, then geothermal could play a a significant role. You know, maybe ten percent, fifteen percent of total usage. Uh -huh. Imagine an op optimistic situation where we could muster the political will to pass a carbon tax, yes. at least on some portion of the economy. Can you talk about the implications, what could be done, and what some of the potential drawbacks might be? Of a carbon tax? Yes. Well, <clears throat> uh, of course I think a carbon tax would be a very good idea. And it would have to be a, a, a really substantial carbon tax. Some of it could be rebated back to um, citizens to offset higher energy costs. But I think it would be a mistake to rebate all of it back because there are so many sy system costs for the energy transition. System costs in uh, research and development, system costs in, in, uh, in grid redesign. Uh, and in management, as well as in you know investment in in uh, renewable generation capacity, so um, you know that that would be a a great future, <laughs> really, if if we had a high carbon tax and and a long range plan. And the th um, the thing about these kinds of, of energy. Uh, generation uh, policies is that they need to be they need to be in for the long run. Uh, Germany has had uh, a, a, a long-term goal of moving toward renewables. They call it the energy venda and it's been in place since the 1970s and so German industry and everyone is more or less on the same page. Not that there, not that there aren't any, you know, boulders in the highway that they have to navigate and so on. They are having various troubles, but they're, they've done more than almost any other country because they've had a long-term commitment. Other countries, like Spain, for example, uh, during the early 2000s, uh, would, had tremendous support for solar and especially wind and a lot of solar and wind were installed and then they changed the policy and suddenly the solar and wind industries almost died. So you, somehow we have to have good policies but they have to be supported long term otherwise it doesn't work. Another question here. Conventional nuclear energy has big problems such as the problem of doing, dealing with waste. But what about alternative nuclear energy that have, have been developed over the years? What is your position on that? Um, we haven't seen um, off-the-shelf technologies that make sense to us in, uh, in terms of, of both the um, environmental security and cost. Still, development of, of 
uh, nuclear is quite expensive compared to other energy sources that we've been talking about. And that's why very few countries are investing in it. China is. But uh, that's uh, in China and India are mostly exceptions. Um, it's very hard to find places where nuclear is growing. And where it is, it's only because of massive government support. But as time goes on, more and more people become aware and, and become concerned. Um, we can't keep going the way we are. And uh, we've, create, we've created a civilization that is um, inherently unsustainable, as I said earlier. Um, it's happened before. Uh, we've seen about 24 civilizations in all of human history, and so far each one has self-destructed in, in one way or another. Our civilization undoubtedly at this point will go through a, a transformation. And whether we call that collapse, or decline, or reinvention, or rebirth, I think it depends on, it depends on what we do. Um, It'll be really interesting for, you know, <laughs> to, to be able to look back a hundred years from now. Of course, we in this room uh, almost certainly won't be around at that time to, to do it. But what we do want to do is, is provide the best options, the best uh, intellectual and other raw materials for those who come after us to be able to, to, uh, to adapt to the new realities that they'll be facing. Because the, the name of the game, I think, is going to be adaptation more than anything else. We can't assume that the same things we've done in the past will have the same effects and impacts in the future that they have before. Um, we need to think very differently for the time that we're moving in. Almost everything is going to be up for redesign and change. I, uh, I used to teach college students, and, uh, um, <clears throat> and they were in a, a year-long program in which we, we went through all of the basic elements of human society and saw how each one had come to be the way it is in the modern industrial world and how, how they were unsustainable. And, and young people, you know, on one hand, were um, very depressed at first to realize, <laughs> you know, just how far out on a limb we are collectively. Uh, but on the other hand, it was exhilarating to realize that all of this is going to have to be redesigned and rethought over the course of the next few decades. This is, it's an incredible responsibility, but it's an incredible opportunity for, the, for th this next generation to rethink how we get our food, how we make our economy work, how we, how we construct a building, how we make decisions together. All of this is up for redesign and renegotiation. So the more we can, we can help that process along, uh, I'm, I'm all for it. Thank you.